Now we've been covering a lot of ground in this module. We've been talking about white spirits and whiskeys. Now we're going to move on to one of the most exciting categories of all, and that is brandy. Brandy are all of those wonderful spirits that are made from fruits, grapes, pears, apples, made into wine and then distilled into brandy. Now, this category is so large, we'd love to be able to cover each of these categories like Pisco, like Brandy de Jerez, uh, like Eau de Vie. We'd love to cover all of these in depth, we just don't have the time. But in the meantime, we're going to be looking at the three great demarcated regions of Brandy for France. Calvados, Cognac, and Armagnac. The word Brandy, where does that come from? Brandewin, Brandewin, the, the Dutch term for burnt wine. And when you think about it, here's our, here's our little uh, demonstration still for a shot. Uh, when you think about our distillation process, what is it other than boiling? It's heating. So the wine, and, and for brandy, it's boiling wine. So that brandy, that wine is burnt. Uh, even though Armagnac preceded Cognac by 200 years, uh, Armagnac production down in Gascony was really happening, uh, but with a pretty good clip uh, in the 13 and 1400s. Cognac, however, didn't really get up to speed till the 1600s. And by 1640, uh, it was pretty clear that what they were doing in Cognac was of particular value. Uh, we have to credit the British. Um, with their understanding, this, their innate understanding and ardor for uh, beverage alcohol. When they, uh, this happened with port, this happened with whiskey, this happened with, with cognac. The British understood quality products and not only would they support it with their commerce, but they would support it with their investment. And cognac really, really hit stride in the 1600s, the late 1600s, early 1700s, when Great Britain and, and uh, commercial entrepreneurs from Britain got involved because they saw the potential of not just no longer having a, a neighborhood mom and pop industry, a cottage industry uh, along the, the, the west uh, coast of France, but an industry that could have true worldwide implications. Cognac, uh, the, the three main cities in, in that really make this brand, this, this category work, are the cities of Cognac, Jarnac, and Sagenzac. La Rochelle is really important because La Rochelle was, uh, was a port uh, that was hugely uh, successful and busy with the commercial transfer of a lot of the commodities goods that Western France and Central France were, were, transport, were exporting to the rest, uh, to Great Britain, uh, to Northern Africa, where they're starting to colonize, uh, and also uh, to Portugal and Spain. And those commodities were salt, salted fish, uh, a lot of salted cod, um, and so, but also wine. And so they, they were shipping wine and then eventually brandy to England. Uh, and the, the river that is really the key is the Charente. And the Charente just goes right through the whole heart of, of Cognac. And it really kind of dissects, it, it really defines the, the regions. And there are six demarcated regions. And they, they kind of fan out. It's almost like, a, I think of it as a bullseye. And the, uh, the Grand Champagne is the, is the bullseye itself. Grand Champagne is the most important uh, because that really is, that's the Bentley. That's the, that's the silver cloud of all those six regions. Uh, Grand Champagne is an interesting region because the, the soil is very, very similar to the Champagne region that's 90 miles northeast of Paris for Champagne. Now, we should also, uh, Doug and I also want to make clear that this has nothing to do with the Champagne region, obviously. It's just similarity, uh, just a, a referral back to the similarity in the soil type. Uh, very calcareous uh, soil that's very, very dusty. Uh, Grand Champagne itself has uh, nice topography. There's lots of hills, and so the grapes that are grown 
are often on sloping sides to the south that face so they get lots of good sunlight. Cognacs that are labeled as Grand Champagne, and we may have a few in here, uh, the ones that are labeled as Grand Champagne, of course, must be 100%. Anything that is labeled as Grand Champagne or any of the other um, category, of, from the other uh, demarcated districts, must be 100% from that region. So if it says Petit Champagne, must be 100%. Uh, there's, it, it's not like, uh, like Cabernet, say, with wine or a varietal where in California it has to be 75%. If it says Grand Champagne or one of the other regions on the label, it must be 100% for that. An exception is Fien Champagne. And Fien Champagne must be a combination of Petit Champagne, which is kind of like the number two region, and at least 50% of Grand Champagne. While Grand Champagne cognacs are extremely long-lived uh, and very, very deep, uh, very, uh, very multi-layered. Uh, Petit Champagne is all, all of those things, but just at a, a notch below that. Um, so th these are the two real key regions that you absolutely should be aware of. This is, these are great talking points for your people who come in and say, yeah, you know, what do you have in cognac that I like? Uh, they're really good talking points. Uh, our next region, which is the little uh, amoeba-shaped region up to the, uh, it's the uh, kind of the uh, topaz-colored region that is to the northwest of, Con of Grand Champagne and Petit Champagne, is Borderies. Um, Doug and I particularly like the, the uh, Borderies cognacs because they have a very nutty, distinctive, almost a very intensely dried fruit taste. Uh, whereas the cognacs from Grand Champagne and Petit Champagne are deep and, and uh, very multi-layered. Uh, borderies are a little bit more approachable and they're, uh, they're actually really lovely. Uh, but you don't find too many of them because uh, the problem is uh, Blending. Blending is the, the key in, in Bordeaux, so you don't find too many borderies uh, labeled cognacs. And I wish there were more. There are only a handful, unfortunately. Also, borderies is a very small uh, area. Um, the area is devoted over to vines in Grand Champagne, about 32,000 acres, 33,000. Uh, Petit Champagne is nearly 40,000, about 39,500. But in the borderies, I mean, it's only 9,900 so acres. So it's, it's not very much in comparison to the other two biggies. But there's another emerging region uh, called Fanbois. The Troisbois uh, are um, Fanbois, Bonbois, and uh, Bois Ordinaire. Though Bois Ordinaire, I must tell you, that name has now been changed over to Bois de Terroir. Fenbois is really making a, a real play now. And uh, there, there are more and more cognacs coming in. Th this is something that's emerging. So this is something that you guys, being uh, cutting edge people, should know about. Uh, yes, uh, Grand Champagne, Petit Champagne, Borderies, every, a lot of consumers are aware of those now. But a real emerging area that it would be good to be cutting edge on is being hip to the fact that there are more and more Fenbois coming into the marketplace now that are 100% Fenbois. And uh, they are not as deep, they are not as illustrious, they're not as lush as the cognacs from Grand Champagne, Petit Champagne, or Borderies. They're more approachable. And in, in a sense, the, the Fenbois people are telling me now that they're couching them as the more contemporary, uh, uh, not quite as old fashioned, as the, the cognacs that are from the traditional big three regions. Now, the, the big four companies that really come into play, of course, are Hennessy, which is by far and away the largest, Courvoisier, Martel, and Remy Martin. Those are the big four. Those are the big four companies that have the money, the muscle, and the marketing power to continue making cognac the, the truly phenomenon uh, that it is within the uh, spirits category. Uh, let's talk about grape types. So we've talked about marketing, we've, talk, we've talked about worldwide presence, we've talked about the six regions. Uh, let's go into a little bit of production now. Grape types, basically, uh, before the, the 1870s, when, of course, what happened in the 1870s and early 1880s? Flags are up. Flags are up. 
the Phylloxera vestastrix uh, louse went through the vineyards of Europe and just decimated them. And of course, since uh, cognac is made from wine, uh, that decimated, that louse decimated the, the vineyards of, of the Charente area, the cognac area as well. Um, before that time, the, the, the real staple grape of cognac was Faux Blanche. And there's a little bit of Faux Blanche still uh, made, and they're trying to kind of regenerate that. Uh, and, and there's some success now. But the reality is Faux Blanche got wiped out by, by the uh, Phylloxera epidemic. Um, so they grafted over in the 1880, mid-1880s to a very sturdy grape called the Ugni Blanc, also known as Saint Emilion. And uh, that grape has done very, very well. Now, um, I've tasted some uh, pre or cognacs, uh, and I have to say the Faux Blanche was pretty, pretty marvelous. Uh, very elegant. Um, I don't want to use the word feminine because then that's anthropomorphizing, which I hate. Uh, but the, the, full, the, the cognacs to me were more delicate pre phylloxera uh, Now they're, they're, they're sturdy and they're, they're much deeper, I think, than they probably were before that. And that's fine because I think really some of the greatest brandy, some of the greatest spirits in the world are coming out of cognac right now, without any doubt. Distillation is very, very clear because the cognac A's are so orderly, and because they are, they're, they're a serious business, they don't mess around, uh, all cognacs are distilled in the Charentaise still. Every cognac is distilled twice in a Charentaise still. Every cognac distilled twice in a pot still. There is no continuous distillation in cognac. The Charente still cannot be larger than 690 gallons. 690 gallons is not very big. Pot stills cannot be larger than 690 gallons, and they cannot, by law, distill to higher than 72% alcohol. Now, what does that mean? The, the lower the alcohol level, the more intense the more deep the distillate. So this is good. Wood, of course, once the spirit comes out of the still at 67.5% alcohol, it needs to be put someplace. So it is put in uh, limousin or tronce oak. And they can only be, and here's, here again, is, is I love this because they're so regulated and, and it's good, I think, at the end of the day. 75 to 125 gallons, that's it. Uh, that's the only type of barrel, that, it's the only size limit that they could have. Uh, 75 to 125 gallons, and that's it. It is very, very humid and very warm, very sultry in the summer, and they lose a lot of cognac to evaporation. They lose, on average, two to three percent per barrel per year to evaporation. Classifications of cognac, as in Armagnac and Calvados, um, are really based upon age, time in wood. Um, the VS, which is very special, or around the world it's called three stars, uh, means that that particular cognac had to have been in barrels for a minimum of two years. That's the youngest. VSOP, which is very superior old pale, not very special old pale, and the, the regulation on that is they must at least have spent four years in, in barrel. XO, Ordage, which is H-O-R-S, and then second word, D apostrophe A-G-E, Napoleon and extra, that's one category. That's essentially the XO category. XO means extra old. Uh, those must be in barrel for at least six years. But the reality is, the reality is, virtually all XOs that you will be pouring or enjoying for yourself in the marketplace are well over six years. So, so those are the basic minimums. Um, 90%, over 90% of cognac is exported. The French drink Armagnac. Uh, 